another week gone by and it's time to welcome you to the week that was this week we look at the stories which made the headlines from 27 july to 2nd august in this edition we look at acts of the police issues pertaining to fishermen death on goan roads which has become a major nightmare connectivity issues and reshuffling of pdas to discuss these and other stories i have with me the group editor of herald publication mr sujay thank gupta you. Thank welcome you. to the show thank you so the first story that we pick up on 27th of july that is wednesday focuses the f- first of our stories focusing on the police with regard to uh, you know the there was a case of assault at the petrol station in valpoi and the valpoi police acted so swiftly that they nabbed the culprits within 24 hours and herald has taken uh, this story and compared it with another brutal assault which was uh, inflicted on farmer leader hanuman parav and in that not even an fir has been filed yes this particular case is getting more and more appalling because uh, the assault on hanuman parav happened almost 90 days ago after that assault and and that assault was not an ordinary assault because what happened here was that the pi of valpoi and the dysp of the area and dysp happens to be sagar ekoskar and the pi uh, his name is naik if i'm not mistaken uh, most probably his name is naik if I, my if my memory serves me right anyway wh- or uh, whoever whoever the pi is now both of them assaulted hanuman parab brutally yeah. hanuman parab had marks on his body proper medical medical examination was also not done hanuman parab ran from pillar to post to ensure that he gets some kind of justice he knocked on the doors of the prime minister's office he knocked on the doors of rashtrapati rashtrapati bhavan the chief secretary of goa has got a letter from the pmo and from the from the rashtrapati bhavan now the point is after this much of intervention from the highest offices of the land if the goa government and the police are refusing to budge then nothing can be more shocking than this point number 1 then the issue here is 90 days later a, a case happens in a petrol pump where there is an altercation with regard to uh, you know the quick filling of petrol yeah. and there one party a assaults the attendants of the petrol pump the irony is that the same pi who is under a cloud for this kind of a brutal attack and who himself should be answering the court yeah. of law happened to be in that in that in that area and swiftly arrested did i am not discounting his efforts he did what he was supposed to do yeah. but when he is doing his duty at the same time when there has been abject dereliction of duty and a criminal act committed by him why aren't people uh, arrested and the issue here is this not this the same sagar ekoskar and as we also reported also is in a cloud in another case when he was the pi of maina kurthuri yeah where there was a you know he along with uh one guy one uh, pi called tejas naik then uh, there was another constable called dheeraj naik, naik then there was another constable called rizwan sheik yeah, yeah. now if you look at these people Th- this is the second case the second case yeah. now they were they essentially uh, were accused of threatening somebody to pay them uh, an amount of bribe of 10 lakhs yeah. now there's a Uh, the 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 victim in this case the alleged victim or the or the sufferer in this case the yeah. guy called floyd cutino yeah. now floyd cutino has has made several representations yeah. and he has made several appeals and he has filed a case for extortion or for blackmail or extortion or whatever now this case also just is in the is in the back burner so the question here is that when it comes to uh, your own people in uniform the police goes out of its way to defend them yeah when it comes to others you are you are quick or not depending on the connections that you have yeah you either bury a case or you or you, or you do not yeah. completely depending on the relationship that you have have with the so called accused now now the point is if an intervention from the pmo and the president can't get uh, an action being taken against a dysp you can really understand the state that we are living in right now. yeah and and uh, just to uh, note uh, the PMO has sent a second letter to the DGP to take action against him. Imagine the PMO has to send send two letters. One letter is not enough. Two letters from the Prime Minister's office for the for action against the DYSP. It is it is it is shocking, but it is completely amusing uh, 
uh, to see the manner in which our system does not work. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, our third story is uh, pertaining to fishing and it is on July 28th Herald newspaper, Thursday, where uh, the banner headline reads, Herald inspired petition on LED fishing violation is leading to court inspired solutions. And in this case, we are talking about eco warrior Claude Alvarez's petition before the High Court for a total ban on LED fishing. Right. See, the thing is, Goa Foundation and Claude Alvarez, of course, he uh, they reacted to uh, the situation. Uh, Herald's cons consistent efforts to highlight the problem of LED fishing, which is uh, essentially ensuring, uh, sadly, that our waters in Goa are devoid of fish because these big trawlers with LED lights uh, arrive at the mouth of the river and and they use those lights to literally uh, sting the fish and they get attracted to those lights and get drawn. Yeah. So not only are the, the, the big fish getting swallowed up literally by these LED lights, but uh, the issue is that the, the, you know the eggs get sucked in, the, yeah. the, the, the babies get sucked in everything you know yeah. there is there is nothing left. Now the point is, that there is actually a ban on LED fish. Now, this ban has not been implemented. Consist then this has been a consistent. Uh, uh, there has been a consistent fallacy that that we are kind of uh, protecting our fishermen and we are ensuring our fishing rights. Every day, the you know under the connivance of big trawler owners, uh, people in government, yeah. uh, former MLAs and ministers, and the fisheries department, all of them are either conniving or they are turning a blind eye, which is as good as being complicit to this whole situation of uh, LED light laden trawlers getting in. And mind you, the problem is not just of rogue trawlers coming in from Karnataka and other states. The issue is that there are many fishermen who live here, Goan mm -hmm. fishermen, and they are absolute biggies. They are the ones who are also using LED lights and ultimately working against their own brethren. Because you must remember our fishermen actually go out to the sea yeah. to, to get food for us. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that they, they go they go out to feed us and they need to feed themselves. We, uh, people who can afford it can make other arrangements. Yeah. They can they can order from outside. They can get in their own fish. They can they can do what they want. But the point is, this is not only an issue of livelihoods of our sons of the soil who go out to sea on a daily basis to to uh, to give us food. It is also very very unfair to uh, to to these people because promises have been made to them. To, uh, uh, government has said that they'll be giving subsidies for fuel, subsidies for the repair of nets, subsidies for the repair of boats. Now, all these are absolutely empty promises. Yeah. You know. Now, in, in this case, uh, you know, the High Court has given instructions to the fisheries department that they have to go and check the trawlers before they go out into the sea. And this is yet another case where the courts are directing the departments to do their daily duties with their I'll go further. As we've seen in the last two days, yesterday, uh, today is uh, is Tuesday on on Monday when the fishing ban got lifted and the season started. Yeah, there was some kind of a lip service done. Uh, some inspection was supposed to be done in the morning. I think a team did go to inspect these uh, uh, these fishing boats. Yeah. But what I hear now is that most of the owners or none of the owners were there. Most of the owners were away. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what kind of uh, inspection happened. Today, apparently, the report that we are getting from the from the jetties is that there are hardly any boats there, so the boats have either gone out, uh, yeah. most probably unchecked. The boats are supposed to come come in later. We'll get to know as you know as we are shooting this this is on the afternoon of Tuesday, yeah. so we expect the boats to come back and see uh, and question them. But uh, yes, it's a sad state of affairs because there is no real seriousness in in checking the menace, in spite of court, the court center. On Friday, 29 July. A very uh, you know deadly kind of headline, very shocking, and now something which is repeated often and often in newspaper headlines uh, pertaining to road accidents. Four lotlikar sink to a dead end. Now, just by way of statistics, the statistics have been put out by the DYSP cautioning people to take care. Uh, in the year 2021, there were 109 fatal accidents. This is DYSP of North or South? South. South. So, so he has given the statistic with regard to 2021. Yes. There were 109 accidents and 112 deaths. In 2021. 2021. Mm. And in 2022, that is up to July uh, 2022, there were 133 fatal accidents with 143 deaths already, which is 31 more deaths repeated, I mean more than last year. With only half the year gone. Yeah, only half the year is gone. 
No, I'll break this into two parts. My response in two points. One, of course, is the accident that happened on that day on the bridge. It is by far one of the most tragic accidents that have ever happened when uh, four friends uh, perished. Mm -hmm. Out of the four friends, two were brothers, and uh, one of the brothers was quote unquote celebrating his birthday on yeah. that day. So he died barely an hour after the his the date of birth started at twelve yeah. twelve midnight. So it's extremely shock shocking. I won't go into the details of what happened, but there were four friends who were going to celebrate their birthday. They were driving, uh, driving fast. They were coming from Lothali to Panjim to you know take the birthday celebrations forward. The, the car was being driven in a rash way. It swerved to the right, uh, proceeding from the Kortali side to the Agasai side, and the car plunged into the river. That is one aspect. Uh, rash driving. We don't know whether it's drunken driving yet. We have not seen the post mortem yeah. of the Visera report, so we will not say anything uh, because you know we out of respect for the dead. Yeah. But at the same time, what is very very important is we should also look at our disaster management, uh, not only facilities yeah. but the efficiency of our disaster management, yeah. the alacrity with which the people should respond, uh, the forces should respond, uh, was sadly lacking, because one cannot understand. Why it took seven to eight yeah. hours to call the navy? Because our coastal police does not have boats; yeah. they do not have trained drivers, divers to get into the sea. So what they were doing immediately after the accident was they were moving around with one kind, of one kind of a boat, just one, yeah. uh, on the surface of the water, and trying to uh, see whether the wreck of the car was was inside the water with a torch. Now this is absolutely primitive. Yeah. I'm not questioning them for their dedication to work. Yeah. But that has to be matched with some efficiency. Yeah. As soon as the navy na naval divers came in, the navy navy was informed at about 7:30. By 7:55, they were at the spot. The divers touched water at 8 o'clock, and I think within two hours they managed to uh, yeah. at least detect the car and yeah. uh, get the stuff out. So my point is, if they could have could touch the water in 25 minutes from being being informed, they could have actually been in the water. By almost by about 1:30, latest by 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I'm not saying they would have saved all the lives, but you never know. A miracle could have happened. Suppose the, you know there was still a, there was a survivor. One could have had a chance to to, to save one or two lives, yeah. or do something. You know. Yeah. So uh, that is a sad state of affairs, and that's that's the way way it is. Our accidents are happening, but our disaster management response needs to be far quicker. Okay, on Saturday, July 31st. Thirtieth is our fifth story, and this is with regard to illegal constructions which are now surfacing in Goa, illegal restaurants and bars of the high and the mighty. Uh, the headline has to do with uh, a question which was raised in the Rajya Sabha by MP Luisin Falero. It says, "Big affirmation: Union government confirms in Rajya Sabha that the old Goa villa is illegal and in violation of the Monuments Act." See, firstly, I think Luisin Ferreira should be should be congratulated for raising this uh, in the zero hour in in Parliament, because very seldom, if at all, are Goan voices heard in Parliament uh, for issues like this. Yeah. And if people were surprised that this issue was being raised, it's a reflection on the people who were surprised, rather than a reflection on the person raising it, because the person who raised it raised issues which a lot of other people including other representatives pass off as being very state state oriented issues yeah. and not to be discussed in parliament the very fact that the the questions were raised the very fact that the questions were taken up and the reply that the government gave the minister for tourism and culture his reply stating that the construction of this old goa villa in the heritage precincts Of Old Goa, the UNESCO protected heritage precincts yeah. next to the Saint Cajetan Church, was in violation of the Ancient Monuments Act. Yeah. Now, this the word violation of the Ancient Monuments Act is very very important. They further said that an NGO has gone in appeal against the decision of the Directorate of Panchayats for not obeying or not agreeing to the resolution passed by the. Old Goa Panchayat to demolish the illegal structure. Yeah. Now, when they when the Old Goa Panchayat took that decision, the Directorate of Panchayats did not ratify that decision, yeah. and the the affected party, the the project proponent, went to the court to stop it, and managed to get a stay. get a stay. So here we have the perpetrators of the 
atrocity against our heritage, managing to hold on due to court interventions and our NGO has actually gone to, one, one good public spirit NGO has gone to court against it, which is why the case is held up. So this is the response of the central government, where it said that there is a violation. When the same issue was raised here in Goa, for the state government. The state government. The state government turns around and say, and does not want to make a single comment saying the matter is subjudice. Look at the difference in approach. Yeah. The centre government said yes, there is a violation, but there is also a matter in court. But our stand is there is a violation. Let the state government at least say we feel or we know it is a violation. Let the court finally decide. At least say that. Here in this case, the government is not even willing to say that there is a violation when there is a clear cut case of violation. And a lot of forgery of documents. Correct. So, this kind of a double double talk doesn't do any good uh, to the confidence of those who are trying to protect our heritage. Okay. Our sixth story is uh, still on July 30th, Saturday. Yeah. And that has to do with mining, a recurring theme which has been there in many of our discussions. In this case, the government finally says that all mining leases have expired. And this is a big relief. And this was when the companies went to court, the mining companies went to court and they are trying to dig in their heels and not give up the leases. Look, the point is, if we look at the uh, February 2014 judgment, that is, that is writ petition 435 by 1, which is known as the uh, mining petition or the Goa Foundation petition, it's called GF1. In that petition, there was a very clear cut directive or a very clear cut observation that these leases are uh, have done mining illegally. I mean, illegal mining has happened in these leases. Yeah. And it should stop. Okay. These leases should not be allowed to function anymore. In uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, 88, the, the second order came, where uh, uh, second order came, given by, headed by a bench of Justice Lokur. Justice Lokur's order which came, which essentially said that these 88 leases are going to be uh, the uh, renewal of the 88 leases will be cancelled. Their Justice Lokur's observations were very, very clear that whatever has happened is absolutely illegal. Subsequently, there are several Supreme Court judgments which have essentially said that these leases cease to uh, cease to exist anymore. Yeah. So, in all all these aspects, it is very clear that none of these leases exist. They are all null and void. The mine owners have been trying their best to present a case before the court that their, the leases that were given to them should not be counted from 1961 onwards, but from 1987 87. onwards when the concessions were converted to leases. Yeah. In effect, they were called concessions earlier, they were called leases later. Yeah. They were relying on that fig leaf of technicality to even now try and say that the leases still belong to them when it is very clear. The significance of this is that the government has now made it very clear that look, we have given you notice to move. Yeah. You should move out of the premises completely, of your leases completely. No leases exist. And more importantly, the EC of none of these leases are not there. Yeah. So the environmental clearance also needs to be... See, everybody knew it. Everybody was aware of it. But this is a very significant statement because this was the first time the government has made a stand explicit before court. And that is why it is important. Okay. Our seventh story is pertaining to the IIT hmm. and it's becoming increasingly difficult where to locate the IIT and people find there is a need for institutions of higher education in Goa but where to locate them and therefore the IIT has been pushed around initially starting from Sange itself. Now in this case the new MLA who has been elected Subhash Faldesai and, and uh, he has put his foot down saying IIT will come to Kortali Sange. And here, in case uh, the Herald has put a box here with regard to Herald view, where the confrontation is taking place between the powerful and the powerless. And the powerless are the landowners. That is exactly the what the situation is and that is why uh, we took that stand, Herald took that stand. We are essentially saying that, look, the need of the R, if the need of the R is to have a IIT, so be it. And we understand it and we support it. Goa needs institutions of higher learning. People who say, what benefit will it do for Goans? That argument I do not do not buy. My point is, if it's a uh, if it's an education institution of great eminence, anybody can come and study there. We will produce more IITians. It is quite possible that more people from Goa will also take part in it. I mean, be students there. So there is a need for IIT. 
but the point here is now the i mean we've literally gone from place to place place to place looking for land to set up the society there were objections in sangi initially then they went to uh, kankon kankon in kankon there were objections that is the time when herald as a newspaper completely supported the project and said it has to happen there it got moved out of there then it went to satri in satri again the issue was and uh, the land of a large number of cashew farmers were there yeah. all of them got together to ensure that it move uh, moved move out of satri for the simple reason they they essentially said that you do an iit but don't destroy our cashew farms yeah. and then they came to sangye yeah. in sangye also one needs to figure out whether there is alternate land available or not do you have to have the iit which destroys farms and plantations Yeah. the need to have engineers is very very important but not at the cost of destructing the and destroying the lives of farmers my point is what is the justification by saying that i will bring an iit to goa and that iit if it has to crush the land and the plantations of people who are already cultivating there yeah. of course there's a whole debate on whether they are cultivating or not cultivating but they are not cultivating because of other extraneous reasons why they cannot cultivate not because they do not want to cultivate yeah. okay now if this happens then the point is the question is it is not about iit or not whether the, whether you want an iit by crushing the fields of farmers and plantations or not you cannot call it call it collateral damage you cannot affect the lives of so many people for an for an iit because those plantation and fields cannot go anywhere else yeah you cannot pluck people's people's uh, homes from one place and plant it somewhere else IIT and iit can, can go somewhere can else go somewhere. but people's farms cannot go somewhere else yeah. my issue is this so if you are serious about about iit as an institution then look for a place iit doesn't have to be in a in an extremely scenic village next to a waterfall or or with a cv one all that you are going there to study Yeah. It can happen in an industrial area. It can happen in so much of land that is there. You see, so much of land has been recovered from the S from the S C Z people. Why can't you do that? I'm saying that there should be serious exercise. If you can find so much of land and give them to builders to do illegal conversions and have big big housing projects, I'm sure you can find land for an IIT. Yeah, that's all. All I have to say. Yeah. So our eighth story takes us to first of August. That is Monday. in this we have a story which is the anchor for page 1 the great disconnect 80% of rural parents switched off with almost no network now in this case we have the airport being located at uh, perne in mopa to be to connect goa to the world and uh, as herald has highlighted people are struggling to make calls from one village to another yes you see the whole area is not just mopa i mean mopa is just one village but you have uh, you have mopa you have kasarwane you have yeah. so many other villages in and around the whole place yeah. in that on the whole uh, penna taluka so in those areas you see i mean people will be, will bear us out there are many remote small hamlets where connectivity is at an all time low and and the irony is that you are living in villages which are literally on the uh, on the edge of where the mopa airport is going to take place yeah. now you have a airport they look at the irony which is going to connect goa to the rest of the world and the people in those villages cannot even connect to the to the next village yeah and and my issue okay people are turning around and saying saying that there's a lot of opposition to mobile towers okay people are not allowing us to be to build mobile towers you but you, but you should sort out these problems you cannot cannot these problems cannot go on and on because see online classes have come down people are going to schools yeah. but they also have to do their lessons lot of information is still coming there they need to do research most of the research is online now yeah. if they cannot make calls to the next village see what i'm saying is on one hand you are the it minister says that we are going to have fiber connectivity reaching every home yeah. my point is you first have connectivity reaching every home you think of fiber connectivity later Yeah. first do connectivity then do fiber connectivity there is no connectivity and we and this is happening rampantly not only there if you go to even even satri taluka it is happening there in satri it is happening in perne it will hap- it's happening in sange you 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 take the road from the netravali village to the to the to, to the interior interior smaller villages from netravali itself 7 to 8 kilometers to the netravali forest there is another village on the other side part of the netravali panchayat the sarpanch of netravali lives in that panchayat there she cannot connect with her own panchayat for 4 four, four days a week so i am essentially saying that these are these are shocking incidents you go to you go to the junction of balli from balli on the on the way to kankon yeah. from balli village from the balli junction if you go go inside just 4 or 5 kilometers from the highway there's no connectivity 
So I'm essentially saying if this is your your level of connectivity in in Goa, then how can you say that Goa is on the fast track to development? Yeah. Fast track to development is not only in your industrial areas in your big cities. No? Okay. Uh, and our ninth mm. story for this week is uh, August second Tuesday, where Herald has this headline: "All in the family, authority moves from Babush to Jennifer," mm. and this is talking about the Greater Panjim Planning and Development Area Authority, which is amalgamated into North Goa Planning and Development Authority. See, when the Greater Panjim uh, Development Authority is called called Greater Panjim PDA, Greater yeah. Panjim Planning and Development yeah. Authority, I actually call it the Greater Political Planning and Development Authority. It's not Greater Panjim. <laughs> the GPPDA is actually P should stand for political because because the GPPDA was given as a political dowry to Babu Shpansarat when he came to Goa Forward Party. <laughs> It was a dowry given to him. Yeah. When the marriage happened, political marriage happened. This was his dowry yeah. that you'll be getting a full PDA. Yeah. Okay, here you get cars and jewelry given on dowry. Dowry. This was a full area given to him on dowry. Yeah. Now, when it was given, look at there was a huge opposition. Yeah. Okay, there were rallies all throughout 2018. There was a rally on February 4th. There was a rally on March 14th. One rally happened uh, in the Santa Cruz village itself, next to the church. Yeah. One rally happened uh, near uh, in Mysore Junction. The two big rallies happened. People from all over the villages, Shirida, <laughs> Kurka, Bamboli, everybody got together and attended those rallies. Essentially, saying that you cannot have a PDA because ultimately that whole area, the Santa Cruz belt, the, it is essentially a rural area. Yeah. Okay, number one, there are fields and low-lying fields. There are farmlands, low-lying fields, mangroves. now once you do a pda what happens is and people don't know immediately your uh, floor area ratio goes up under a pda yeah. now you under your floor area ratio you ultimately uh, can build big but when you build big you also have to build deep yeah so that affects your water table it affects your water resources and when you when you are going so high up why do you need to have so many houses for builders have we have we even calculated the housing needs of of that area yeah. or goa for the next 20 years if you calculate all the people from bombay who might come and buy second homes and if you look at the total number of homes that were that would have been built under this area it would still not match up yeah so this is what we need to do so these areas are not not needed and at the same time the decision to disband the goa political pda whatever it's called greater political pda is called yeah. the region the, the yeah. decision to disband it and amalgamated to the north goa pda is also a political decision yeah. though it is a good decision because you know it is one pda less yeah. but what happens is now the greater panjim pda to use its correct term for once is controlled by babush monsarat yeah. clear cut there's no no issue here the north goa pda is controlled by jennifer monsarat so essentially it is going from the from the husband to the wife yeah the irony here is now jennifer monserrat who was her, herself a minister before is now reporting to vishwajit rane who was a, a ministerial colleague now yeah. so my point is it is still very confusing as to who who is going to be the winner here we certainly know that vishwajit rane will be controlling the whole situation yeah. as a tcb minister he has a right to let's yeah. put it this way yeah. now jennifer monserrat is now the ngpd i think now whether babush monserrat loses out in this or he is actually the beneficiary of this that that we still need to do a bit of research but at the end of the day we've said all in the family because for obvious reasons when it's going going from the mr to the mrs they obviously the whole thing is going to be in the fam family but i just hope that jokes apart and the light hearted banter apart that our planning needs are taken care of properly and illegal conversions do not happen and we have a proper plan and we get the regional plan in place and let that be our bible for all kinds of planning okay okay so in in many of these discussions that you know have been pointed out by our uh, guest uh, uh, group editor of herald publication mr sujay gupta you will find that very often it is the departments who have to get their act together whether it is the police whether it is disaster management whether it is the pdas they have to get their act together and perform their duties on that note we wind up this week from 27 july to 2 august we hope that you enjoyed this edition of the week that was keep watching herald tv